This is the Monday, November 7th, 2016 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new interview every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. There is a war going on in the... South Vietnam, I think uh, last week there were over 500 uh, killings, assassinations, uh, bombings. Uh, the casualties are high. It's a, uh, I said last week, a subterranean war, guerrilla war, of increasing uh, ferocity. The United States, since the end of the uh, Geneva Accord, setting up the South Vietnamese government as an independent government, has been assisting Vietnam economically to maintain its independence and viability, and also has sent training groups out there which have been expanded in recent weeks as the attacks on the government and on the people of South Vietnam have increased. We are out there on training and on uh, transportation and uh, we are uh, assisting in every way we properly can people of South Vietnam who with the greatest courage and with the under under danger are attempting to maintain their freedom. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. That was President John F. Kennedy in 1962 speaking about his administration's support for the Republic of Vietnam, commonly called South Vietnam. South Vietnam is not to be confused with the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, which was neither a democracy nor a republic but a precursor to the communist one-party state that we see on the map today. The music you're hearing in the background is the national anthem of that lost democracy, South Vietnam, a state that we'll get to see up close and personal this week, warts and all, and view in contrast to that government that ultimately succeeded it and imposed its will on the people of all Vietnam. This is our first book in a graphic novel format, and our first guest will be joining us from France. And for those of us old enough to remember a day when a call like that would really cost you and you'd have to go through an operator, that's still pretty amazing. Marcelino Truong is both author and illustrator of the brand new book, Such a Lovely Little War, Saigon, 1961-63. This graphic memoir shows us the years of the Vietnam War through the eyes of young Marcelino, as a boy called Marco, the son of a Vietnamese diplomat and his French-born wife, whose bipolar disorder adds another dimension of conflict to the family's life as their father serves the president of the Republic of Vietnam. As you can guess, I have a big pile of books on my desk, and sometimes when I'm going down the dinosaur tail like Fred Flintstone to get to the subway under Radio City, I'll snatch up one of the books for my commute, and I might not even look at what's inside. When I selected such a lovely little war, I didn't expect a graphic novel, and I was pleasantly surprised to open it up and find all these great illustrations. For one thing, these are really vivid images. Drawings I'd linger over for detail and flip back as the story progressed. It was as if Mr. Truong drew snapshots straight out of his childhood memories and shared them with us so that we could get a picture of the build-up to America's involvement in the war. You can learn about our guest and enjoy more of his work at MarcelinoTruong.com. That's Marcelino with one L and the last name is T-R-U-O-N-G. Note that his website is in French, but you don't need to read the language to enjoy his illustrations. Okay, now that we've buckled into our time machine and started the chronometer spinning backwards, let's ring up Marcelino Truong at the dawn of such a lovely little war. I'm joined on the line from Paris by Marcelino Truong, author and illustrator of 
Such a Lovely Little War, Saigon, 1961-63. to Thank you for making the time to talk with the History Author Show. Thank you. When I picked up Such a Lovely Little War from my slush pile, I didn't expect the illustrated version of your family's story. I just expected a standard memoir. I thought it had a very nice drawing on the cover, but I wasn't expecting it to be illustrated. And I wondered how this came about, how you decided on that medium. Was there ever a desire on your part or a push from somebody on the publishing side or anything like that to write a traditional memoir, or did this always seem a natural to illustrate it? Well, I had been tempted to tell this story in prose, you know, as a traditional memoir. And there were several attempts on my part that have remained in my uh, drawers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get that from reading it. A lot of these things seem like they were on pads of paper and boxes you maybe moved a bunch of times and then put into the book. That you can say. I mean, this the idea to write this story goes back a long way. But then I started all these different attempts at writing it. But then the opportunity came to produce a graphic novel because I mentioned this project to a publisher I've known for a long time called Jean-Luc Fromental. He's the head of De Noël Graphic, De Noël Graphique, which publishes well, graphic novels. And when this opportunity showed up, well, I, I seized it. I did actually at one point suggest a book allying prose and illustrations or pictures, you know, images but he insisted on me producing a graphic novel. And I think he was right, because the graphic novel genre allows for certain tricks and also enables you to instill a bit of humor, I think, in a subject which could have been a bit serious, you know. So I think it's a fine medium to express complex uh, stories to which you can add a touch of humor. I think that always happens when you have a child involved in the story. You're writing about yourself here as a young boy and with your brother and your sister. And so we all know that there's a war going on, but they'll say little funny things. They're looking at the girls, for instance, the domestics that your parents hire and this kind of thing as they're becoming aware of the differences between men and women. And you're very right. I'm reading it and it does make you realize you remain a child even in the midst of this war. And that was your story, your feeling. This was still your childhood. You had to find time for a childhood. And the beginning of the war, 1961 to 63, roughly John F. Kennedy's presidency, this is your childhood. And you just happened to be in South Vietnam for a while. So tell listeners, how old are you in those years? And what brings your father and your whole family to this position of working with the president of South Vietnam? Well, when I was a child, my father was a junior diplomat for South Vietnam, also called the Republic of Vietnam, capital Saigon, right? This is South Vietnam we're talking about at a time when Vietnam had been divided into two parts. The north, capital Hanoi, was a communist regime. And the south, capital Saigon, as I said, was building, shall we say, a... Let's call it in the terms of the Cold War, the liberal free state. We were trying to build a, a non-communist state. Anyway, my father was a diplomat. So in 1958, he was sent to Washington, D.C., where we spent three years. When we arrived, I was, I was an infant. I must have been about a year old. I was born in the Philippines, hence my first name, which is Spanish. Right. Because we lived in, in Manila in a street called La Calle San Marcelino. Anyway, we, we ended up in Washington, and approximately three years after our arrival, Kennedy, President Kennedy, was elected. And it was due to the fact that Kennedy had been elected that father was called back to Saigon by the South Vietnamese government because Kennedy had plans for Southeast Asia, and especially Kennedy wanted to back South Vietnam and to strengthen it against a possible communist threat using, again, the terms that were used in those days. We went back to Saigon in July 1961, and almost immediately my father started work with the president as one of his interpreters. 
translating conversations from English into Vietnamese between the president and many English-speaking visitors in Saigon. That's how we arrived in, in Vietnam. Our stay in Vietnam was practically the length of President Kennedy's mandate. You pick up a book about any war, but especially the Vietnam War, and you may expect there to be a lot of pushing and pulling politically. But I found that, and I mean it as a compliment, you maintain that childlike view in the sense of just idealistic and real. Children don't tend to look at things and think, what should I say, right? They just say, well, if they see a fat person, they, they'll they say, you know, why is that person so big, right? If they see a large person or they see a war, they'll they just know that it's a terrible thing. They won't think of what the politics were behind it. And you have this eclectic background I was going to bring up since you mentioned your name. Here you have a Spanish name because you're in the Philippines and your mother is French, your father's Vietnamese. You grow up for a while in America, then go to Vietnam, which we're focusing on today and England for quite a while, and then now living in France. So this gives you a very broad perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, the Vietnam War was a huge thing, as you know, during the 60s and 70s, and it became central in many debates. People would position themselves politically against the backdrop of the Vietnam War. You were either for peace and against the war, which most people would claim to be, People were often reluctant to say they were hawks because you don't get very popular when you say that. But there were people who believed that this war was dreadful but necessary. Now, in France, for instance, the Vietnam War, I would say a majority of people in France were very sympathetic to the cause of Hanoi, of Ho Chi Minh, of North Vietnam, and saw the Vietnam War as the continuing conflict between David and Goliath. And of course, when you're a nice person, you want to back David, you don't want to back Goliath. And most people believe that the thing to do was, well, to show sympathy for the Vietnamese communists because they were leading this very heroic and brave struggle against the huge American Gulliver. There were even posters in those days showing that war as a struggle between Gulliver and the Lilliputians, the Vietnamese Lilliputians. Now, I think that image is powerful, but it's simplistic. And that what it doesn't say was that, of course, the Vietnamese communist David was heroic. Of course he was heroic, but was his cause heroic? But I don't think so. The regime, the system that the Vietnamese communists from Hanoi wanted to impose on the South and which they managed to in the end, was not something I find one has to be sympathetic with. This was a Stalinist Maoist regime. And this was pretty obvious when you look at the pictures and read the books and read what they said and the images they wanted to convey. Look at them again today. They're all in the books. You can find them on YouTube. All those films made by the North Vietnamese, for me, reek of a totalitarian state. When you're drawing some of those childhood pictures that you include in the book, you draw many of these weapons of war and things that happen. You draw a U.S. aircraft carrier, and yet you continue to draw when you get older. And I found it amazing when I read your self-taught so how do you go from this doodling as a child to a professional who can tell such a lovely little war as a professional, get it published, and yet maintain that vision that a child has of getting the humor you talked about a little bit, but also telling your story? Well, it took me a long time to acquire, let's call it the skill, to produce a graphic novel of that length. You know, it didn't happen overnight. To make a long story short, I wasn't groomed to become an artist. I was prepared to become, well, my father would have wanted me to become a diplomat or something or an upper civil servant, you know, but serving the French state, going to a famous school um, where all our political leaders come from, actually, called the National Administration School in France. But I went half the way. After three years of public law, I decided I was only 20 years old when I had done equivalent of a, of a master or something. And then I decided to, I was looking for something a bit more bohemian, anything more bohemian <laughs> sounded nice. So I went on to study English literature at the Sorbonne and I got my degrees and all that. But at the age of 25, after a year of teaching English, I decided to give up all that 
and to become an artist in a humble sense, a comic strip artist, you know, trying anything to do with drawing illustration. So at the age of 25, I launched into that career, learning on the job as I worked. So it was a long process. I had to spend about 10 years, I would say, learning the job of an illustrator. And only then did I allow myself to think of writing one or two short stories for um, young readers, you know, the nice picture books you, that are produced for children. I would do that once or twice a year. The rest of the time I would be doing commissions. Well, around 2009, 2010, this opportunity arised and I took it. But it was a long, long process. And well, when you talk about the childhood vision in the book, yes, hopefully one can find this childhood vision in the way I describe our games and how we felt about things every day. But there's also above the picture, above the frame, there's a voice off, which is my voice of today. You know, it's the 59 year old Marco who looks back at that period and offers a judgment with distance. You see, there's both. There's the childhood vision of war and also the mature, much too mature adult <laughs> vision of today. One thing about the title, such a lovely little war, to me, reminded me of, I guess it was William Randolph Hearst who said the Spanish-American War, wherein America comes into possession of the Philippines, by the way, was a splendid little mm -hmm. war. I wondered if that was an influence or obviously it's an irony, the title, but where did you get the title and did you kick around other ideas for it? It's funny because very recently I read a few things about the Spanish-American War and uh, Theodore Roosevelt and all that. But actually, my title doesn't come from that. I wasn't aware of the Randolph Hearst Splendid Little War comment. No, my, there are several influences. Of course, it's a, a, an ironical title. No war is pretty. But I think that it comes from several, or it has several origins. When I was a child or a, an adolescent in, in, in England in the 70s, in London, there was a play a very progressive play called Oh, What a Lovely Little War by Joan Littlewood. And later this was brought to the screen by Richard Attenborough with a huge cast of very famous British actors. And that was also an influence. That film was about the First World War and it was very critical of the role of the English and all European establishments in not preventing this war and, and not stopping it. That's one of the influences. The other influence for such a lovely little war is a book, a, a brilliant American book I read while I was documenting this subject. The book is called uh, Once Upon a Distant War, written by a man called William Procknow. It's a brilliant book about the American reporters who covered the war from the outset till the end. There were many who went through Vietnam. There were dozens, there were perhaps hundreds some of whom became famous, like David Holberstam or Neil Sheehan. In that book, Procknow goes into great detail and he describes the fact that Vietnam in those early days, I want to make this quite clear, the early days of the Vietnam War, the early 60s, at that time the war was still a pretty small thing compared to what it became later, especially after 1965 in the Johnson years. At the beginning, it was still a small little war which could be covered without too much risk. And you could cover the war while staying in Saigon, which was a very pleasant city in Southeast Asia where you could still feel the French influence lingering on. The food was good. The people were very friendly in spite of the beginning of the war, in spite of the difficulties that were accumulating. But... Americans who went through that period often said this was one of the most exhilarating periods of their life. And I must say that for me as a child, it was the same. I always remember that period. And that's why I was so eager for years after that to one day tell this story, you see. So I also shared this sense of exhilaration because I suppose we were safe relatively and of course didn't suffer as such some people may have suffered. So for us, it did have some, well, let's say exciting aspects uh, for a child uh, as I was anyway. 
I talked about the illustrations and speaking about your childhood, it seemed to me that you were almost drawing these images straight out of your memory. I don't know if that makes sense, but if people want to see it, they'll have to pick up such a lovely little war and look at it. But that's how it felt to me. It was really something, an intimate portrait of what your memories would be and vivid and yet simply drawn. Again, I'm contradicting myself a little, but there are things even that you maybe didn't witness, like the illustrations of beheadings, which if you hear about that as a child, you picture it a certain way, I'm sure. You don't picture it as it truly is. You, you just don't know. But it sounds like something that's interesting, the bravery maybe of somebody that's standing up to that. How did you work as being both illustrator and author? Did you start with these images and then write to them? You talk about writing your adult thoughts there above it. Or did you start with the words and then add in the illustrations as the things came back to you? I started writing the story in great detail, in as much detail as possible, because, you know, I didn't have a great experience of scenario writing. I didn't have any experience to mention. So I played this along uh, by instinct. And one of the ways I wanted to reassure myself I could do this and reassure my publisher, too, because you have to deliver the goods, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> was to write the story page by page in the greatest detail as possible, because I needed to reassure myself that I would, how do you say that, fall on my feet again, mm -hmm. as we say in French. So the images all along the way, and for years I've been reading books and collecting testimonies and talking with people about the Vietnam War, seeing all the films and all the documentaries. So I've been gathering all this stuff all along the way, and I still do actually because the more you delve into it, the more interesting it becomes. But the process, the order was write the story first as a scenario and then start illustrating it. Because I knew that when the illustrating part came up, I knew that I would always be able to manage something. That came from the experience of 30 years as an illustrator. You know, you've got a subject to illustrate. Whatever the subject, you manage to find the documentation. You look for the, the images, you know, you, you manage. I was more worried about the writing. You mentioned the, the beheadings. I do mention that once or twice in the book that what was happening in Vietnam was that South Vietnam, as I said, was trying to build a nation, a non-communist regime. Some people called it a fascist regime. I don't think that's quite true, actually. Knowing my father, who took part as a civil servant in that government or in that administration, he was certainly not a fascist. He admired the British parliamentary system, the BBC, the Western world democracies. And he was dreaming of the same thing for Vietnam, eventually, you know. But the problem is that as soon as South Vietnam was created and born in 1954-55, very quickly, North Vietnam and also those communist Vietnamese in South Vietnam, who were in South Vietnam, they rejected this Republic of Vietnam. They called it a puppet regime, puppet of the U.S., of course. And they tried starting in 1956, 57 and 59 onwards to overthrow the government using subversive methods. This was a revolutionary war at first. It later became a conventional war, but there were always two wars at the same time, a conventional war and a revolutionary one. Now, in the revolutionary war, Terror, along with persuasion, is the main tool that is used. And beheadings were probably, well, what happens not all the time and not only beheadings. But there was talk about this when I was a child. There was a lot of talk about people being assassinated, people disappearing, people being abducted sometimes beheaded. Beheaded, I showed this in the book because you have to see this from an illustrator's point of view. It's one of the most graphic ways to eliminate your opponents, if you see what I mean. It's shocking, you know, visually. Yeah, you said uh, a little bit about the propaganda value and about fighting a revolution that way. So you know, that's certainly not something anyone wants to go through. Well, our opponents were using, the, you know, the, the Vietnam War didn't start in 1960, really. It started in 1945, just after the Second World War. Right at the end of the Second World War, I would say it started in March 1945 when the Japanese were still there. Now, one of the methods 
to terrorize your your opponents. And this terror was also used by the extreme right. It wasn't only used, of course, by the extreme left. It was used by both sides. And one of the most terrifying things you can do is chop people's heads off, you know. So this was one of the techniques used to instill terror in the minds and to try to dominate the population, either through persuasion, through positive ideals like justice or democracy or freedom or independence was the big word mm -hmm. that so many people acted upon, independence. And this went on later on in the 60s. Terror was one of the means that the, it's a quick way of gaining people's cooperation using terror. I wanted to go back a moment to what you said about your father, and you were talking there about wanting to be an illustrator, living the bohemian life, as you called it. I think when you have young people listening, I always think of people that are maybe in their early 20s as you were, you kind of have that epiphany thinking about, I want to change. I want to do something more creative. I had a similar one myself, having gone to school for animal science, then deciding I wanted something that had more to do with writing. Your brother, I learned, faces kind of the same dilemma, the same parental pressure. I think parents don't realize sometimes the pressure that they put on children. A teaspoon of criticism sometimes is so much coming from a parent, right? Or, or even advice, mm -hmm. you know, or even pressure. And you don't always realize that that is a, an ocean maybe that builds up over time for a child that wants to please. I know your father passed away before the publication, but how did he feel about the book? You illustrate this in such a lovely little war, but how did he feel over time that you decided you weren't going to pursue this career in diplomacy, you weren't going to go into government, but that you were going to have a more eclectic career? Well, my poor father found it very difficult, of course, when I was 25 and I announced after after succeeding at least two very difficult public exams in France, that I decided to turn my back on this and start off in what was for us, for our family, completely the unknown, because we had absolutely no knowledge of work in the artistic domain, like being a graphic artist or comic strip artist or an illustrator. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about a painter even, you know, just working as an illustrator for the press or publishing world. We didn't know about these jobs. So it was pretty frightening for him, I suppose. Very frightening for me, too. I, I can tell you that many a time I thought I'd done a silly, mad move by turning away from a possible job being a university teacher or something to go for a comic strip, because this is a very, very different world. But, well, my mother was very helpful when I started off. She did all she could to help me along. My father, I think his main strength at that time was not to object too loudly at all, you know, just to let me go ahead with it. And as things went along after, you know, years of uh, hard work, as I began to make my place in the job, he became very encouraging. And when I would go to my parents' place, I would see my publications here and there on the walls, or he would buy the newspaper when I ever had an article. He was very encouraging. This was all very new to him because in Vietnam, you know, Vietnam... This generation, my father's generation, they believed in achievements and school achievements, school, university. He was a scholar, you know. You had to be good at school. That was the big thing. There wasn't much patience with children who weren't academic, as my brother Dominique wasn't academic. He had a, a great gift for art. Actually, there's a sequel to Such a Lovely War, which hasn't been published in English yet, but it exists in France, and it's called Give Peace a Chance. It's got an English title. And in, the, in Give Peace a Chance, there are many pages about my brother Dominic. What he experienced was experienced by many other youngsters of his generation, of my generation. The feeling of being ill-adapted, you know, of wanting to drop out, of not knowing where your place is. Dominic had that, and he also had a great gift for drawing, painting, which I think went largely unnoticed by my parents, but worst of all, by himself. Because in the world of art, you have to believe in yourself first. No one's going to go looking for you, or very few people. So it's up to you to believe in your own star, and I would say mostly to put in a lot of hard work, you know, 
Dominique didn't realize really his gift and he went past it, I think. And he's no longer with us, so people know, which is why, yeah, unfortunately. My brother, um, well, it was a a long process, but he took his own life uh, when he was 26. This was a long time ago. This was in 1979, after the hippie period. My brother went through all that, you know, the, the trips to India, the hippie period. And also he joined a community. I would be sort of tempted to say it was a sect but most people call it a community, a community in in India called the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh community. He was part of that. It was based in Pune in India. And then later on went off to Canada and became, I think it still exists, it's called Osho now. O-S-H-O, Osho. He was part of that. My guest is Marcelino Churong author and illustrator of the graphic memoir Such a Lovely Little War, Saigon, 1961-1963. to You can find some of his illustrations online at marcelinotruong.com or read about it if you paid attention in high school French class or perhaps are a bilingual Canadian. I like to always cite something here that's a favorable quote about the book. And I found this time I had my own because you have such an economy of words, which is necessary in this kind of work. You're, the pictures do some of the lifting, but you also, in any writing, first rule, eliminate unnecessary words. Try to get as much as you can done in as little as possible. And you write a touching line in Such a Lovely Little War that your grandmother, quote, communicated through feelings and food, unquote. That spoke to me. I've talked about my grandmother before on the show. Food, especially when you're a child, you don't necessarily have the same language. My Greek was not excellent. My grandmother's English varied, was not was not excellent either. So I wondered, what challenges have you faced? We talked about all these cultures that you've been uh, pinballed between a little bit. So what challenges did you face in that shift between cultures and languages And did that help to inspire your choice to develop this skill at a universal medium of art? As you say, my grandmother would cook food for us, Vietnamese specialities, because my grandmother, I'm talking about my paternal grandmother. So I'm talking about our Vietnamese grandmother. She only spoke Vietnamese. She didn't speak French. My grandfather from Vietnam spoke quite good French. But my grandmother didn't, so, and our Vietnamese, the Truong children, wasn't very, very good because at home we spoke French. We didn't speak Vietnamese, we spoke French because our mother was French. And also perhaps because in the Vietnam of those days after the colonial period, in middle class families in Vietnam, uh, either north or south, it was quite common to hear people speaking French. I would say 75% of the time, because this was a cultured thing to do. This was a posh thing to do. Not only posh, but cultured, I would say. So my grandmother would cook these fantastic dishes from the fantastic Vietnamese recipes, and that conquered us, of course. <laughs> Later on in life, when we left Vietnam in 63, I was only six years old. I was four years old when we arrived in Saigon. I was six when we left. I was really young. And you'll wonder how I remembered all that. Well, I had some very clear images, and I still have them. But of course, many things had escaped me. What was very helpful for me later on to write this story was that my mother, my French mother, Yvette, she wrote lots of letters to her parents in France from all the countries we lived in. So there are letters from Manila, there are letters from Washington, D.C., and there are letters from Saigon, and there are letters from London. All these letters were kept by my grandparents in France. And luckily, it was very easy to lay my hands on them. You just had to go to my mum's room, the home in Brittany, and pick up the stack of letters from Vietnam, which I did. So thanks to that, I was able to reconstruct our daily family timeline. How did we move? How did we settle in a new apartment? Things like that, which make up the daily life of a family. And then I added my own experience and also the result of all the reading and documentation I'd carried out. But to go back to your question, arriving in England in 1963, we all, as Truong children, had to learn English properly. We had a sort of smattering of English uh, from our, our days in Washington. But then we had to take things seriously in England. 
And we dropped Vietnamese entirely, I'm afraid, while in England, because, well, our parents insisted that we learn French and English properly, as they said. In the process, well, the Vietnamese language went down the hatch, and I forgot <laughs> most of it. Actually, I forgot everything. The first time I returned to Vietnam in 1991, believe it or not, I didn't even know the word for hello or thank you. I didn't know a single word of Vietnamese. Wow. I, later on, in the following years, I was so fascinated by my returns to Vietnam that I started learning the language, you know, with a language method and cassettes. That's where I got my basics. Unfortunately, I'm busy and I'm probably, well, I'm not motivated enough. And it's a difficult language. So I only know the basics. I can't go far. I, I would in no way be able to conduct this conversation in Vietnamese. No way. <laughs> you should have learned the cooking. Then you could have communicated. I do. Oh, you do? I do. You go. <laughs> I, do. I do a lot of cooking. There you go. French and Vietnamese, yes. I wonder if your father being in the diplomatic corps, if that impacted him conducting things in French too, because for centuries, that was the language that all diplomats spoke. So did he conduct a lot of business in French? As you say, French was the diplomatic language for years. When my father started working in 1951, actually, during the French Indochina War, he worked both in Vietnamese and in French because this was still the French Indochina War going on. What is not very well known is that the French gave Vietnam its independence in 1948, but this went unnoticed because Ho Chi Minh, the communist leader of the Vietnamese left wing, fighting for independence, had sort of attracted all the attention on, on himself. But the French did try to provide the Vietnamese, the non-communist Vietnamese, with another option. Independence, but not a communist independence. An independence which could evolve later into something which looks like a Western democracy. So my father went for that, and then he started working from Paris, actually, both in Vietnamese and in French, but not French as a diplomatic language, just French, because this was the language of our former colonial, um, I don't know what word to use, I don't want to use the word master, it sounds too gross, uh, of our... Occupier? Yeah, you know, that's administration, I suppose. The Vietnamese of my father's generation, they all spoke French pretty fluently, because most of them had studied in France. Hmm. My father left Vietnam in 1948, with his two brothers and at least three cousins on a ship, on a slow ship from Vietnam, from Saigon to Marseille in the south of France. You know, this took about a month because all these youngsters were coming to Europe, mainly to France and Belgium, with scholarships to study. You know, they all had scholarships and they all graduated from French or Belgian universities. And these were the men who created the Republic of Vietnam in the 50s. They had all been to school in the West. So that I'm coming back to this cliche. We were often told that the South was a fascist regime. It probably looked like a fascist regime when the military took things over during the war, because war makes things very fascist, whatever the war. There's a quote in, in times of war, the law falls silent. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> that's sort of that it kind of thing. It falls silent, but then the men and, and women, of course, in the South who tried to build a nation, I think many of them were trying to build a country with laws, you know, but it's not an easy thing to do with a war raging. War tends to limit liberties, as we see nowadays, you know. It's a struggle to hold on to liberties when there's a war, because war, well, you're tempted to take shortcuts when there's a war, you know. Do away with civil liberties to be more efficient. Of course, democracies struggle with that. Dictatorships have no trouble at all with that, doing away with liberties. Take North Vietnam during the Indochina Wars, the communist Vietnamese, they had no trouble with doing away with liberties because for them, it was the objective that was important. No matter what the means, the main objective is all important. So let's do away with liberties if we have to. In the South, in spite of all its flaws, the government of Vietnam tried to respect liberties. And I believe the South was a much more livable place than the North. And again, I must insist that the men and women in the South, many of them were educated people who were hoping that Vietnam would move 
from the position of a colonized country to a modern country or developing country, developing along the lines of the Western democracy and economy model. I wanted to come to your mother. We talked about your father. All of these letters, these are personal letters. There's so much that is private information in there. You write very frankly about your mother's struggle with bipolar disorder, and you include this one stark sentence about your vacation from school. You say, we were a burden on mama during these periods of forced togetherness. And your father's position here for her being so far from France, being in Vietnam is a complete cultural change. The men are very different. The social order is very different. You also have an illustration there that depicts your mother's moods. The face is low, ebb, slack, flood. My godmother, my father's sister, she also suffered from this disorder. And I could recognize that as I opened the pages of Such a Lovely Little War and saw those panels. But with being so personal and open, I wonder if you've heard from anybody who, either in your family who said maybe you don't want to publish that, or people who are glad that you did shine a little bit of a spotlight on this and say it's not something to be ashamed of. I'm glad you mentioned this. Of course, our mother, my mother was bipolar. We didn't call it bipolar, by the way, when I was young at all. We would say mom's depressed or mom's tired or mom's ill Depressed was the word which would come up most often. Uh, bipolar is, a, I think, it's a it's a new word. It's a sort of, in a way, a euphemism, a good euphemism. But all our youth, we had this threat of um, of um, kind of a storm breaking. That's it. Thanks. That's what I exactly. This cloud accumulating. Uh, this cloud was always above our heads. There was always a risk that mum being upset by something or being overly tired would break out into a, a sort of storm. Uh, now, I don't want to paint my mother as someone unpleasant. She wasn't at all. She was a charming person, very good looking and very sweet and a bit shy. This is an illness, you know, mm. she, it sort of falls on you. Uh, we, I have a few theories about the origins of her disposition. I think it came from several shocks in her youth. The result, anyway, for people who live around bipolar persons is that these persons can be absolutely charming one minute and then, with a practically no transition, become uh, Mr. Hyde. It's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in the same day. So it can be a pretty rough ride. And one of the things which is difficult for people of that disposition who are mothers or fathers, especially mothers, I think, with four children, it's not a cozy job, is that holidays weigh heavily on your shoulders because you have the kids at home all the time. They're not at school. And my mother took her duties very seriously. You know, she thought we have to get them busy. They're not doing much at school. We have to get them doing something worthwhile, clever, not wasting their time. Anyway, she would be panicked at the thought of having us for long school holidays, which I understand having brought up three daughters. I know it's a great pleasure, but it's also a burden. Uh, responsibility having your children during the holidays. <laughs> it's not always easy. So mother was affected by our presence and her storms broke out often during the holidays, unfortunately, Christmas or Easter or whatever. I describe her moods using the words you use, you know, low, slack, ebb, because my mother was from uh, Brittany in France. Both my parents rest in Brittany now, they're both gone. But we have a house near the sea in Brittany, and the sea of Brittany, the coast of Brittany, played an important part in our lives. And uh, there's a very, very important tide in Brittany. It's not like the Mediterranean. You know, so that the weather in Brittany can be very present. It's difficult to abstract yourself from the weather in, in Brittany. When it's raining, it really rains. When it's windy, it, it's windy like hell. And it's often sunny too, but it's not an easy climate. And I think this climate, my mother's mood swings could be compared to the climate changes in, in Brittany. You mentioned the sequel. Give Peace a Chance is not yet translated into English. As far as translating such a lovely little war, 
For someone with such attention to detail and with such a firm idea that's been percolating for 50 years of what you wanted to say, how did that collaboration go for the translation? Was it very involved? How did you make sure that he got the nuances of your descriptions and dialogue just right? Well, David Omel, whom I, I haven't met yet, I certainly hope to meet him soon and we have plans to meet up. He lives in Montreal in Canada. David Homel, I didn't know this, but is a famous translator. I had no idea. Contacted me in a very, very friendly manner on the on internet whenever he had queries about certain idiomatic expressions or the Truong family idiomatic expressions, things we sort of made up. You know, every family has its own idioms. So did we. And when he, whenever he got stuck on those, he'd write to me and I'd be really grateful for him to do so because maybe some other translator might have refused to ask for help, and he didn't. He produced a very fine translation, which I was privileged to read. That, again, I wasn't expecting that at all. I didn't know what to expect. And I was able to read his translation, which was really good. I just helped him out in certain places where I realized the French expression I'd used was really colloquial, you know, that he couldn't be expected to know that particular detail. But our collaboration was very friendly. He's a very nice guy. Recently, it's, it's quite funny, he's, he's translating uh, Give Peace a Chance, the sequel at the moment, right now. The last mail I got from him was a question. He said, very often your mother or the children start a sentence with a word or is it a sound? It spells R-O-H, R-O-H. What does that mean? So I said to him, ah, R-O-H, is a, it's, not, it's not really a word. It's a sort of exclamation. It's typically French. It goes like this. It's oh, oh, oh. You know, like in the Jacques Tati films. They're always making <laughs> yeah. those weird noises that, that the English make great fun of, you know. Right. And ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, means all sorts of things. It means <laughs> It means admiration. It means annoyment. It means impatience, you know, all of those depending on the way you say it. But it's really hard to translate in English, <laughs> by the way. But that's the sort of query he'd come up with. It's not easy to get a lot of those sounds. There's some in Greek, too, that you say, how do I write this? Sometimes I want to make a joke to somebody. Those are hard things to write off phonetically. So that's interesting. I am looking forward to the sequel. So. Uh, we'll talk about that, hopefully, when it comes out. Hopefully, you'll enjoy this experience, want to join me again. But I do have one final question about the broad perspective that you have. You fly into Saigon as a boy, summer 1961. Here, we're recording this. You're publishing the book in 2016. So I wonder what changes in opinion did you have about the Vietnam War, about how things went right and wrong. This is a little bit of what you touch on in the book with your father as an adult talking with him. Doesn't push a point of view beyond maybe the ultimate futility of such a war. So what do you hope people take away after they read that last speech balloon, the last illustration? Well, I hope the reader will come to the realization, hopefully, that the Vietnam War was a complex thing, of course, that's obvious, but I hope he will realize that the non-communist Vietnamese, who sometimes became anti-communist, not because this was their temperament, but because of the war, because of the struggle, these people were closer to us, us in the West, I mean, you know, Western democracy, we want free speech, we enjoy rock music, we enjoy culture, which is free from any intervention of the state. This is what we were for, too, in Saigon. Saigon was a capital which had its eyes turned to the West. We enjoyed Western freedom, freedom in the sense that you find in Western culture, so that this war was wrongly depicted, I find, as a struggle between the nice David and the evil, nasty Western imperialist Goliath and his henchmen, his puppets, meaning us, the South Vietnamese, that's unfair. There was an element of that, but only an element of that. This was a struggle, I think, carried out with too much power. That's what's lost, I think, is that we try to use conventional means, America and the South Vietnamese, in a revolutionary war. Again, I come back to this idea. This was a war for 
the domination of the spirits of the souls more than territory so that conventional means weren't adapted. They wouldn't solve the thing. So I, I'm hoping that people will look at the efforts of South Vietnam and of America and our other allies, Australia, for instance, and Thailand, look at those efforts with a more understanding approach. The people from South Vietnam were not fascists. Only a few became fascists because war makes you a fascist. Any war makes anyone a fascist if you get too much of it, you know. But we were not trying to set up a fascist regime. We would have hoped for a civil government. That's what we had in the beginning. So I'm hoping that people will understand that our endeavor was often clumsy. We made huge mistakes, but that what we were hoping for was what we us two talking together today have already. We live in countries where you can speak freely. You won't go to prison. You won't be beaten up. You won't be harassed. Whereas Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh was not a haven of freedom and of free speech. It was many other things. They were very brave. They were very heroic. But so were the Germans during the Second World War. The German people were heroic. That doesn't make the Nazi cause any more acceptable, if you see what I mean. You know, mm -hmm. peoples can be heroic. The Russians were heroic during the Second World War. Stalin's regime was awful, but the Russians were heroic all the way. So I think one has to look at what happened to the countries that were colonized. What happened after the independences they reached, they attained? Did they become great democracies in the way we hope, you know, we, we like? Unfortunately, many a time they didn't. They evolved into something very undemocratic and very either Maoist or Stalinist. That's what I mean to say, you know. Take another look at the Vietnam War. The Americans and us, their allies, are often depicted as the baddies. Well, have a look at the other side. Look at the other side now. The other side now has won, and they are now ruling Vietnam. Well, Vietnam is led by a one-party it's a one-party system. The, the Communist Party rules. It allows for no opposition at all. This conversation we're holding now on a social network couldn't be done in Vietnam today. You are not allowed to go against the official version of the Vietnam War. The official version of the Vietnam War is very easy. I can tell it to you in two words. They say everyone was for Ho Chi Minh and the Communists and that those other Vietnamese who fought as henchmen of the Americans or the French were traitors, and they don't deserve to be called Vietnamese. I find that very, very, very simplistic, and it's just untrue. The Vietnamese were divided from the outset, from 1945. There was a right, there was a left, just like in any other country. And all this rubbish about everyone thinking alike and being all for Ho Chi Minh is just a lie. It doesn't stand to study. Well, I hope that when people read such a lovely little war, we'll all take a little look at who we're rooting for maybe in the world, what we think we know, and evaluate it. As you were speaking there about the idea of this heroic David, I was reminded of something that Christopher Hitchens said in a movie theater, and they showed a newsreel, and it was about the Spanish Civil War, and they said, and the rebels advanced, and all of these young college-age students or people started cheering, and he said, no, those those are the fascists. It just so happens they were <laughs> rebelling against their government. But of course, if you ask them, they would never have said that they were cheering for fascists. It just, as you said, we root for the rebel, the underdog, especially I think the French and Americans very much have that in common. You want the rebels to win. It just sounds good, but that's not always the case. And I think in this war, maybe Maybe people would like to boil it down to two words, but you'll get much more than two words on it. And also each picture speaking a thousand words, as they say, in such a lovely little war. I want to thank you so much for joining me today all the way from Paris and for sharing this intimate view of your family and the war from just a few feet off the ground as little Marco the childhood view of these early years of the Vietnam War. I am looking forward to picking up the sequel as soon as David is done translating it, Give Peace a Chance. But until then, best of luck with this book, Such a Lovely Little War. I hope that it sells a million copies. Thanks a lot, Dean. It was a privilege speaking with you. Mm -hmm.
Again, the book is Such a Lovely Little War, Saigon, 1961-63. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there. Amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every dollar you spend at no additional cost to you. Thank you to Marcelino Truong for joining us long distance from Paris and for sharing a unique story of the early years of the Vietnam War. Please visit him at MarcelinoTruong.com. Yes, his website is in French, but the vivid illustrations, like all good art, speak the universal language. We also hope you'll let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. Okay, that's it for this graphic installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview. And remember, if you subscribe to us on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today. We'll leave you with a clip of President Richard Nixon on January 23rd, 1973, announcing what the Republic of Vietnam and its backers in the free world, including the Chirongs, hoped would be a lasting peace that secured its personal liberties, a dream of democracy that was lost despite years of sacrifice and hardship. I have asked for this radio and television time tonight for the purpose of announcing that we today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia. The following statement is being issued at this moment in Washington and Hanoi. At 1230 Paris time today, January 23, 1973, the agreement on ending the war and restoring peace in Vietnam was initialed by Dr. Henry Kissinger on behalf of the United States and Special Advisor Lee Duc Tho on behalf of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. The agreement will be formally signed by the parties participating in the Paris Conference on Vietnam on January 27, 1973 at the International Conference Center in Paris. The ceasefire will take effect at 2400 Greenwich Mean Time, January 27, 1973. The United States and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam express the hope that this agreement will ensure stable peace in Vietnam and contribute to the preservation of lasting peace in Indochina and Southeast Asia. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.